Hello everyone, Juxtaposition here. Today's video will focus on um, Shirak Khatami, who is an Iranian citizen, um, Iranian photojournalist, who is completely indoctrinated into British intelligence and CIA from an early age. And uh, he committed uh, suborn perjury at the Charles Manson trial under threat of basically death and deportation to Iran. That was in 1970. Um, however, you should know that um, he's just one of many uh, witnesses of the 82 witnesses called by the prosecution at the Charles Manson murder trial, a.k.a. the Manson family, which never existed in real life and didn't really exist in the courtroom. But uh, they did have four people in the courtroom. They had Charles Manson and three little girls. Patricia Krenwinkel, age 21, Susan Atkins, age 21, with a 10-month-old little baby boy. And um, they also had uh, Leslie Van Houten, age 19. Now, they were actually a year older than I just said because the trial didn't happen until July 1970 when many of the people had had uh, birthdays. So, Charlie Manson, I think, was 36 years old when he was put on trial. Completely innocent completely innocent anyway that could, if I did a video on the Manson trial it could go on for six months um, because there were so much criminal activity unethical behavior suborn forgery fake evidence planted evidence um, I would suggest that a minimum of 41 of the 82 witnesses all lied on the stand under threat of being charged with crimes themselves and that the trial was run by Evel Younger, who was the district attorney and never appeared in the courtroom himself, and Aaron Stovich, who was the, uh, the senior prosecutor and asked most of the questions and made the decision on which witnesses to call and in which order to call them. Vincent Bolosi being kind of the fifth banana on the case, even Paul Caruso, a Beverly Hills lawyer and a highly unethical individual, had a higher status than Vincent Bolosi did. So a lot of uh, wrists were uh, twisted behind the scenes and a lot of people were threatened behind the scenes and that could be run through a variety of CIA operatives, which would include um, Paul Caruso and other people who worked as consultants for the district attorney's office and you wouldn't necessarily know their name, like uh, Reeve Whitson, for example. So people not called in the trial not present in the courtroom, but yet had a lot of contact with the witnesses who were called because there was a lot of liar, liar, pants on fire going on to convict um, four innocent people. And you'll notice that Charles Watson is not in the courtroom. And according to the idiotic story, um, he's the one who did all the stabbing of 154 puncture wounds via a military M7 bayonet that we never used that word. Instead, we want to imply that perhaps a buck knife was used, even though we know for certain a buck knife was not used. In fact, no knives were used. I got an email message from a, you know, a believer in Poppycock, um, a purveyor of Poppycock. I think he has 3,000 subscribers to his channel. So he thinks he's a real expert on the Charles Manson and uh, Sharon Tate murder case. And he thinks that you'd go on the property with knives. Wrong! Wrong! I got news for you. A bayonet is not a knife. It's a dagger. It's a double-edged dagger. It's not a knife. Knives are single-edged. This is double-edged. This is a military weapon. And it would be attached to a rifle. You wouldn't go on the property with just the bayonet. You'd have it attached to a rifle if for no reason other than to be able to lean your entire body weight into your targets. Anyway, what I want to tell you is I'm just selecting this one witness out of 82 witnesses called by the defense. You should know the defense never never presented a defense, so they called zero witnesses, nor did they recall any of the 82 witnesses and ask direct questions of them. They didn't do that either, which is really a, a mendacity unto itself. It, it just demonstrates that the fix was in for the Manson people. All right, so... And I know why they didn't want Charles Charles Watson in the courtroom, because it would have probably been impossible to convict Charlie Wat Manson or any of the girls if you had a six foot two, you know, hundred and 
seventy pound athletic guy in the courtroom. It just creates a lot of confusion. So you keep him out of the courtroom. You convict the four scapegoats. Then you bring in, you know, Charles Watson later by himself solo and convict him. It's a lot easier to do it that way. So this uh, Shirak Hatami, through no fault of his own, happened to be born in, in Iran, ended up in Tehran. And uh, during a turbulent time when he was 20 years old, it was 1950. And in 1950, we had the Shah of Iran. You may remember the Shah. The Shah of Iran became, took over from his father in 1941. And um, at, at the age of 20, 21 years old, he became the junior Shah. And then for nine years, he ruled as the prince uh, king, the young king, the Shah. Shah means king. And um, I guess the natives got restless. So a decision was made and uh, the Iranian legislati legislative elections were promulgated. And in 1951, they held an election whereby Mohammad Mossadegh was elected as prime minister, even though the Shah was still the king, but we had a prime minister who was democratically elected and he was the so-called leader of Iran, which as you know is the number three oil producer. And I'm trying to think of the order here is, uh... no, I think Iran is number one. <laughs> <laughs> Iran's number one, Venezuela's number two, and Iraq's number three, based on today's production. Iran's numero uno. So this is a very important story because everything's about oil, and you know British intelligence would be all over Iran because uh, you know Shell Oil and British Petroleum, aka BP, right? BP is British Petroleum. They're all over Iran. So. It turns out that uh, everything was going swimmingly well for uh, Mohammad Mossadegh in his first year, but then uh, he wanted to audit the British Petroleum record keeping because he thought that they were being cheated on their royalty payments for all the oil that was being shipped out from Iran overseas through British Petroleum. And so that uh, went over like a lead balloon because probably BP was cheating on their auditing accounting records. So in any case, uh, discussions were held, went back and forth, and then Mohammed Mossadegh made a fatal decision to nationalize the British Petroleum Company, meaning that he would take over control of the refineries and the port facilities from British Petroleum's people. So, uh, of course, this didn't sit well, so it was decision was made to overthrow him through a British intelligence MI6 coup in 1953, and then reassert the Shah of Iran, who was already the king of Iran, but to take uh, Mohammad uh, Riza Pahlavi and to make him assume the duties of the prime minister. Because see, now, now he's a little older, he's 33 years old, and he can handle the job. And that's what they did, and they threw, um, they threw the prime minister, Mohammad uh, Mossadegh, into uh, house arrest. They didn't execute him, but they kept him basically incarcerated for the remainder of his life. And the young Shah took uh, took back power on paper. But let's be honest, British intelligence is running Iran, okay? Just like CIA runs the United States. Not Sleepy Joe. So, what else is new? So, in order to MK Ultra fake out you know, the public, and especially the bird brain American public, you have to have propaganda. So you have photojournalists, and this 20 year old Shira Katami was recruited to work for a newspaper in Tehran in 1951, which is perfect timing for the election. Then they reassigned him to the Black Star Agency. That's right, I said Black Star Agency. That sounds like British intelligence. And um, he works there, and he also has all of his photographs are published in Life magazine. You know, the owner of the Zabruder film, the heavily edited Zabruder film, Life magazine, is basically the distribution platform for <laughs> Shirak Hatami. His introduction to the United States is through Life magazine and Black Star Agency. Anyway, he documents the overthrow of the prime minister, 
uh, through a coup, which is a righteous coup, so-called. And um, what do you know? Everything goes back to the way it used to be with the uh, Shah of Iran. So we have the young Shah, 33 years old, back into the power. And uh, it's Reza Pahlavi. Muhammad Reza Pahlavi is the Shah of Iran. Then, after this is uh, handled, Shirak Hatami, you know, who's now 24 years old, he's sent to Paris, France, and uh, decided to make him into a social engineer in France. Uh, so he immediately is introduced to Coco Chanel and all of her fine products and all of her beautiful models. And he takes thousands of photographs of Coco Chanel personally, as well as hundreds of her models over the next several years. And um, he is published in Paris Match magazine. And um, this is his introduction from politics into fashion, the world of high fashion, and which is a form of social engineering, right? And into the hearts and minds of the women of the world. All right, so that goes on. And then the next step is to uh, integrate the models and the photography of course with BBC entertainment films and television and of course Hollywood actors and actresses so he goes on to um, be introduced to Sophia Loren to Julie Christie to Ingrid Bergman and then John Lennon and the Beatlemania and covering the uh, Cavern Club in, um, in England and uh, documenting the Beatles, which looked like they got a lot of CIA and British intelligence uh, promotional help. Um, long, don't forget they appeared on Ed Sullivan of the Masonic Evil Eyes CBS in 1964. Shortly after the John Kennedy assassination, the Beatles appeared on Ed Sullivan Show, which is a CIA-endorsed program as part of the Columbia Broadcasting System run by William Paley, who works for the OSS in World War II and became a colonel in the army having never spent any time in the army and he was chief of uh, war psychological programs psychops you know you'd think that the walter cronkite was in the news business but it turns out no walter cronkite did the cbs evening news which apparently was a psychological warfare presentation because that's who he worked for william s paley the same age he had the exact same age as walt disney and uh, William Paley owned, of course, 15% uh, of CBS. So he's sort of like a Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos is to Amazon what William S. Paley was to CBS, a fake owner. So they expand Shirak Hatami's base to include Marlon Brando, Steve McQueen, and they integrate them in with, um, let's see who else here, Elizabeth Taylor, Ursula Andrus, who was the first James Bond girl in Dr. No. He does photo shoots with uh, all these women to promote their beauty and sophistication. And then um, he's integrated in with uh, Hollywood Films in New York, Rosemary's Baby, Casino Real, What's New Pussycat, that would include Peter Sellers. Um, Dr. Shivago, and um, he meets Roman Polanski, he meets Mia Farrow, he does a documentary called Mia and Roman, Mia and Roman when they were filming um, Rosemary's Baby at the Dakota, you know where John Lennon was murdered, at the Dakota in New York, um, across from Central Park, um, Shirak Atami did a short documentary called Mia and Roman. Mia was 21 years old. Roman Polanski was 33 at the time. And this was when, um, you'll notice, quick like a bunny rabbit, uh, Roman Polanski does a vampire movie with Sharon Tate, and then they immediately get married. There was no courtship. There was no engagement period. There were no engagement parties. There was just a fake wedding with no ceremony at the Chelsea Registry in MI6, British Intelligence, London, to get allegedly some paperwork that no one ever saw the paperwork hopped in the taxi and over to the Hugh Hefner Playboy Club in London 
over there by Green Park and uh, in the same building that the Process Church of the Church of Scientology is located. It was under the name of uh, the Compulsion um, Development Department. What was it called? Yeah, Compulsion Analysis Dep Division. Compulsion Analysis Division of the Church of Scientology was in the same building that the Playboy Club was in. And that's where they had a two-hour cocktail party, which has been told to us that that was a wedding reception. But I believe it was a cocktail party on a Friday afternoon. I believe it was January 23rd, 1968. So it's not Saturday, it's Friday. And half the guests were British actors and actresses, a.k.a. spooks. And the other half, um, there were 100 guests, and 50 were actors and actresses, and 50 were MI6 intelligence agents proper. So you notice all the photographs are of the pretty people, like uh, Michael Caine and, and um, what was the guy that was in Manchurian Candidate, uh, Harvey. Um, the guy who played the assassin in um, in the Manchurian Candidate was a guest at the uh, Sharon Tate, Roman Tate, Roman Polanski fake wedding. And so, uh, I'm not sure if Shirakatami attended that. Uh, they had other photographers. But what you should know is that there are many stories about how Shirakatami was personal friends with Yoko Ono and personal friends with Mia Farrow and personal friends with Rome Polanski and Sharon Tate. That's all poppycock. The, 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 there are hundreds of photographers and they take pictures of all the Hollywood and people and all the politicians, you know, like Mohammed Mossadegh, and they're double agents. They work for whoever's in power. The Shah of Iran, Mohammed Mossadegh, democratically elected, and then later the Ayatollah Khomeini, who, who uh, Shirak Katami flew on the private jet with uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini, who's a religious leader who took over after the Shah in 1978-79. So what I'm trying to tell you is he takes pictures of whoever is being promoted in the national news. And he works for the CIA and he works for British intelligence. And these, these actors like Marlon Brando or Ingrid Bergman or Elizabeth Taylor or, or, or Sharon Tate, they're a dime a dozen. It's whoever is scheduled for him to photo shoot. And the reason I'm bringing this up is that he took Sharon Tate's photograph and duplicated the Michelle Morgan photos, which were taken in late 1944 on the Cielo Drive murder scene property. And he took the same photograph of um, that, he, that was taken of Michelle Morgan in 1944. And he did the same thing with Sharon Tate on March 23rd on a Sunday, Sunday morning, March 23rd, 1969, He's photographing Sharon Tate all over the Cielo Drive property, which we all know is on Bella. It's on Bella Drive. But they want you to believe it's Cielo Drive. It's not. It's Bella Drive. It's on a terrace that was excavated into the steep hillside, and it's on a road called Bella. Off Cielo Drive. So um, it would be easier to come onto that property from Sunbrook Drive off of Angela Drive. If you really want to get to the property, forget about Cielo. Blow off Cielo Drive and take Angelo Drive to Sunbrook and then just walk up the ice plant. You'll be on the property a lot quicker than you ever would by using Bella, which is going to take longer. So anyway, you see, you have to go visit the properties to know what's going on here. Anyway, so Shirakatami spent the morning of Sunday... Um, March 23rd, 1969, photographing Sharon Tate before she jumped on a plane the next day, Monday, the 24th, to fly to Rome, Italy, to be with um, Orson Welles and film her last film, um, 13 Chairs, and you know that Sharon's contract was expiring and she wasn't going to be booked for any further work. She was going to have a baby. She didn't get an abortion and she didn't renew her contract. So she's done as an actress. And Shirakatami goes on to do a lot more work after this. Anyway, when it was decided four months after the murders to blame everything on Charlie Manson, um, the prosecution, which again is run by Evel Younger and Aaron Stovich, nothing to do with Vincent Bugliosi, who's getting donuts and coffee. 
Anyway, um, it was decided to have some witnesses to try to implicate Charles Manson since there was no murder weapons found. There were no murder weapons that were used in the murder of the crime. This was the murder weapon used in the crime, and it was not found, ever, not ever. And there were a dozen of these weapons with rifles, a dozen rifles and a dozen bayonets, and they were none of them were found. A buck knife was found. This was not used in the murder, but it was found at the crime scene in the sofa, in the junky sofa. All right, so it was decided that somebody should tell Shiraka Tommy to lie and tell a story that a man that looked a lot like Charlie Manson came on the property around noontime on Sunday alone by himself. Now that's a lie because Charlie Manson doesn't have a driver's license and he doesn't own a car and he doesn't have any money. So there is no way Charlie Manson can appear anywhere alone by himself. He has to have a chauffeur. So that part of the story is already wrong. Then he said he that, that, that Charlie Manson asked to see Terry Melcher and uh, the Shiraka Tommy said he didn't know who Terry Melcher was, which probably is a lie because he probably does know who Doris Day is and this is Doris Day's son. But in any case, he claims he didn't. He told the man that he didn't know who Terry Melcher is and go talk to Rudy Altabelli in the pool house. You know, the openly gay homosexual man, age 40, uh, who lives in the pool house with William Garrickson, the 19 year old homosexual boy with the three dogs. So, according to Shiraka Tommy, the, the man walked around back to the pool house. That's his story. Then he went home. You know, because this is probably about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, perhaps 2 o'clock in the afternoon at the latest. Sundown is 7.30. However, when we get out to the murder trial, you know, seven, eight months later, and you get Ruti Aldabelli on the stand, he says, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, um, I remember Charlie Manson um, came and visited me between 8 p.m. and 9 p.m., in other words, of pitch darkness, on that Sunday night. And, um, and I told him that Terry Melcher didn't live there anymore. And Charlie Manson said, yeah, I know he doesn't, but I wanted to know where he lived. And I said, oh, he lives with his mother, Doris Day, in Malibu Gated Colony. And then I said, I'm going away. And Charlie said, I'd like to come back and talk to you more. And he said, well, I'll be gone for a year. So then Charlie left and he was by himself alone. Well, that's a lie because Charlie doesn't own a car and he can't be alone. And the other problem is it's 830 at night and... Shiraka Tommy saw Charlie at around one o'clock in the afternoon. So were you gonna tell me he's gonna wait around for eight hours to talk to Rudy Altabelli? I mean, what the heck is going on here? So they can't even get their stories straight. And um, then it turns out that there was, uh, outside of the presence of the jury, there was a meeting with Judge Older and um, Irvine Kanarek, who's Charlie Manson's lawyer, and Vincent Bugliosi, and uh, where it was agreed that uh, Vincent Bugliosi said that he did interview Chirac and Tommy, but he didn't tape record it. And, and the only people in the room were himself, Vincent Bugliosi, Chirac and Tommy, and Reeves Whitson. Those three, pre and there's no record of what was discussed. I can assure you what was discussed is either do what I tell you, or you're going to be deported back to Tehran and you'll never come back to the United States. And there's a little problem with uh, Chirac and Tommy going back to Iran because he's well-known double agent because he's on everybody's side. He's on the Shah of Iran side, then he switched over to Mohammed Mossadegh's side, then he switched back to the Shah of Iran side, then he switched to the Ayatollah Khomeini and flew on his private jet. So who, and since people don't like double agents, it's he'll either be imprisoned or murdered if he's sent back. So in order to save his ass, as he was quoted as telling Tom O'Neill in the Chaos book, Shiraka Tommy said that he to did what he was told or else he would be deported, and that most of the threats came from Reeve Whitson, who's a CIA operative in the intelligence community. And he also told Tom O'Neill that he got a telephone call at 7 o'clock in the morning on Saturday morning, August 9th, 1969, the morning that Sharon Tate was murdered, and that Reeve Whitson told Chirac and Tommy on the telephone at 7 a.m. This is before the bodies were discovered. The housekeeper, the fake housekeeper, Winifred Chapman, she doesn't arrive until 8.30 a.m., according to her poppycock story, because she committed perjury also. And she had to have ment mental shock treatment done to her 
at the UCLA Medical Center before she testified at the murder trial because she had a nervous breakdown. And they said, oh, she was in shock. Yeah, months after the murder, she's still in shock. She didn't want to lie. That was her problem. She didn't want to lie. So she had to be medically treated at the UCLA Medical Center before she could testify at the grand jury and then testify again at the murder trial. She had medical treatment at UCLA. You know, where Louis Julian West, CIA, MK Alter psychiatrist works there. <laughs> you know, he worked in Haight-Ashbury also with Susan Atkins and Charlie Manson. He worked with them in San Francisco. He works with with uh, Winifred Chapman in Los Angeles. You know, he worked with the Jonestown survivors to deprogram them from their horrific uh, mass murder in the Guiana jungle. You know, the CIA psychiatrist who's Department of Psychology at UCLA. That, that Louis Jolion West. Anyway, what I'm trying to tell you is that, um, is that Chiraka Tommy lied, and he lied under suborn perjury because he was going to be deported and threatened by Vincent Bugliosi, who's a complete milkman, stalker, unfaithful, dishonest, kidnapped his milkman's little son. So he's a criminal of his own making. So that's that. And this was told to Tom O'Neill, you know, decades after the fact. So that's enough to get the murder charges overturned. Stephen Kay, who was the junior sixth banana on the case, he knows about all this, and he didn't do a damn thing about it. And that's because he'll get whacked. Stephen Kay is in on the fraud because he has to live the lie and that he built his whole career trying to deny parole to the Manson family, who is totally innocent. So just wanted you to know that uh, it's no surprise that uh, if you have your photograph taken by... Shirak Atami, there's a fairly high probability you're going to get murdered. You could try to ask John Lennon, but he's dead. You could ask Yoko Ono. I think she's still alive. She would know Shirak, Shirak Hatami. But I mean, look at Sharon Tate, you know, and and look at the look at the Shah of Iran. He had his photograph taken by him. <laughs> Wonder how Coco Chanel is doing. But anyway, let's see who else he took pictures of. Uh. Yeah, Marlon Brando lived okay, I guess. Uh, anyway, Elizabeth Taylor had her, whatever, six or seven marriages. And um, he's a CIA photographer. And he's not the only one. I mean, you other journalists that you've heard of is Joan Didion. She worked for Vogue magazine. She's a domestic version of Shiraka Tommy. Her husband, she married John Dunn. He works for Time Life, you know, the Zabruder film Fraudulent Distributors, the Moon Landing Experts, Time Life. And um, that's all poppycock uh, production over there at Lifetime. And then uh, John Dunn's older brother is Dominic Dunn for Vanity Fair. He covered the O.J. Simpson trial. He covers all kinds of social engineering events. The O.J. Simpson trial, as you remember, got turned into CRT, critical race theory, because they uh, acquitted O.J. Simpson. They acquitted O.J. Simpson, and it created a division between the blacks and the whites. So the O.J. Simpson trial was actually a CIA psychological operation, just like the Sharon Tate murder being rolled out as Helter Skelter. That was a CRT, critical race theory. It was poppycock. It was absurd. It made no sense. It didn't explain the Lino La Bianca murder, which is in a working class neighborhood, completely devoid of the narrative of Helter Skelter. But anyway, what I'm trying to tell you is chaos, which is a CIA operation, is about mixed messages and people can glom onto whatever poppycock story that they're emotionally uh, congruent with. And that's what it's all about, people. And that's what the coronavirus is. It's a psychops. And that's the end of my video today. Please hit the like and subscribe. Have a great day. Bye-bye.